Unfortunately for our common sense, there are an infinite number of spaces that are homogeneous and isotropic, and only exactly one of them abides by Euclid's axioms. To show what I mean, let's take this concept of a cylindrical coordinate system and play with it for a little bit. My goal now is to dislodge some of the biases you may have concerning the, quote, obvious nature of space. I'm going to help you first with the old 1979 video game Atari Asteroids. When you play Asteroids, you're piloting this little spaceship around trying to blow up some asteroids, and as you do so, the asteroids float through the space of the video game. Now, if a rock or an asteroid goes off the right-hand side of the screen, here denoted by the green boundary, then it'll appear immediately on the left-hand side on the other green boundary. Therefore, the right-hand side and the left-hand side are stitched together, kind of like a cylinder. It's very similar to the coordinate system we just looked at, except now you can't go into or out of the screen. You are in a two-dimensional space that feels like it has three dimensions. A good way to describe it is by imagining that the left and right sides are stitched together into a cylinder that has some fixed radius. And this radius is easy to describe. Take the width of the screen and divide it by 2 pi. That's the radius of this cylinder. Now, this is still a completely 2D space. It's just not a simple space. The relationship between the points in the space is different than the simple Euclidean plane. However, a cylindrical surface can still abide by Euclid's axioms. We next throw Euclid completely out in the Asteroids game because the cylindrical space is also reflected on the top and bottom. It's a double cylinder. The top is stitched to the bottom in exactly the same way the right and left hand sides are stitched together. So you can go up, cross the top, and then appear at the bottom. Now that's very hard to visualize. In addition, it's not a sphere. A sphere would also stitch the right-hand side and left-hand sides together, but the top line would now need to become a point. Also, spheres don't connect the North Pole to the South Pole. This means the space of asteroids is a torus, or donut shape. To see why it's a torus, imagine a circle drawn on the screen. As long as the circle doesn't cross the stitches, then you can shrink the circle to a point. But if the circle is big enough to cross the stitches, then the best you can do is to make it a straight line. But notice we can still describe the entire space of asteroids in two dimensions. We just have two special rules that we add to it. Go off the right, come from the left, go off the top, come up from the bottom. But the location of those stitches is arbitrary. It's just the boundaries of the video screen, and that's all it is. The visualization of the torus that you see exists only to help you understand it. Philosophically and mathematically, there is no physical reason for the 3D world to exist in which the torus appears. We only need the two dimensions on the surface of the torus to make the Atari game space work. We can further demonstrate the potential weirdnesses of spaces with some etchings by M.C. Escher. His ascending and descending from 1960 displays two lines of monks, one continually ascending and the other continually descending on the same set of stairs. The stairwell is drawn to be a perpetual loop. An interesting concept because this is a two-dimensional surface, right? A piece of paper. And on it, we have a three-dimensional sort of building which obviously cannot live in a normal three-dimensional world. No matter how you would look at this building, it can't be built in reality. One of his classics is Relativity from 1953. This one is even more mixed up than the stairs of monks. You can't imagine or determine which way is down because there are so many downs in this image. You can continuously traverse the stairway around and around and around or down and down and down. And each time you do, you have to rotate your orientation based upon the current notion of down. So this is a non-simply connected three-dimensional sort of space that is projected onto two dimensions. But to its embedded dimensionality, there could be perhaps a fourth spatial dimension. But I'm not sure. No matter what, this can't exist inside of any three-dimensional real universe. Importantly though, how would you assign coordinates to this space? No matter how you do it, you will necessarily need to have cross products in the metric. That would mean that the distances would rely not just on the squares of x, y, and z, but on the products x, y, y, z, and x, z. What a yucky setup. I leave its devising to an extremely intrepid student. The real reason to talk about all this is to loosen up the concept of space and dimensionality. 
We can clearly create, quote, impossible objects so long as the objects obey certain rules. Then they no longer appear impossible. We can create rules of spaces that allow for non-simple connectivity and non-trivial spaces where lower dimensional spaces can be sufficient in of themselves without demanding additional hidden or imperceptible dimensions. This is the beginning of the intuition to understand why space can be called curved, yet it doesn't bend into anything or out of anything. We won't deal with spaces like Escher envisioned. We will look at spaces that evidence seems to point to that fit our reality. Remember that a space is simply a collection of points. We can relate sets of these points to other subsets of these points in any way we choose. But it's a matter of experiment as to whether or not these connections we chose fit reality. Our intuition may not be the correct guide. For example, we know from previous lectures that the path of light is curved in a gravitational field. Now let's see what we get when we look at the universe's global curvature. We have to start by going a very long time ago, 300 BC, to visit Euclid. He wrote the great masterwork on geometry called The Elements, which is very much worthy of study today. Every high school student doing geometry studies Euclid's axioms. These five axioms of Euclid are fundamental and give us the basis of what we would call flat space or uncurved space. This starting point harkens to our most intuitive way of thinking about space. The first axiom states that you can draw a straight line segment joining two points. It may seem obvious, but that's the purpose of axioms, to explicitly declare our intentions. What an interesting concept, because you can take any two points, no matter where they are in space, in a Euclidean flat space. Now let me start using that word, a Euclidean flat metric space. We can now draw what we might call a straight line between them. We don't have to curve around anything to join these two points. The fact that Euclid uses the word can here is also interesting. It implicitly means that along that segment, we can stop anywhere and choose any of the infinite number of points on that segment to make a shorter segment. The second axiom extends the first to state that carrying the line's direction along the same direction it was a tiny step ago, we can make arbitrarily long segments, each dense with points. This is a key concept of the real number line and a key idea of what we think of as space. We can always find space between any two points. Furthermore, the space between them has no kinks, whereby we have to change direction in order to go from one point to an arbitrarily close point. This changes and extends the idea of a line segment into a line. In relativity, we would call this concept a geodesic. Euclid's second axiom posits an infinite universe. He means that every line segment points off to infinity in either direction of the segment. You just have to take the time to walk it, which of course you can. Again, I want to point out that you could lie an arrow down on the segment and push it along so that the arrow is never askew from the segment. The arrow will then stay pointing in the same direction as you push it off to infinity. The third axiom now relates line segments to areas and specifically gives a method to create the model of perfection, the circle. The third axiom could have used a square to give the concept of area, but the circle was a deep puzzle to the ancient Greeks. They understood that even though it could be created with a fixed length segment, there is no integer or fractional value of the segment that can be laid perfectly around the circumference. That's the whole 2 pi r thing. It was quite a mystical concept, but this was just a small part of why circles became regarded as symbolic of the celestial or heavenly realm. Euclid was giving us a way to relate the mundane to the sublime. The fourth axiom is also very odd on the surface. Axioms are weird because they always state the obvious. So, right angles are congruent. This simply means that every right angle is the same as every other right angle. That's an interesting statement of the homogeneity and isotropy of Euclidean space. Euclid here expands his geometry into the third spatial dimension by taking the highly obvious exercise of taking a T-square and rotating it around in your hand in any possible orientation. If you take a T-square and rotate it, Euclid's axiom states that it does not change. It also states that any reader of his elements can do this at any location and implicitly at any time. 
Only the second axiom asks us to try to do some action by extending a line segment. This second axiom states that if you were to do this, then there is no end to the line or its straightness. The fourth axiom allows us to toss right angles around however we want at any time in the past or future, and they will always stay the same. We can also note that a right angle is composed of two line segments. This axiom also means that we can extend the segments indefinitely, and that angle stays a right angle. We can take a segment out of the infinitely long lines radiating away from this right angle vertex and drag it, arrow style, all the way back to the right angle vertex, and it'll still be lined up with the original line segment of the right angle. This is a really important concept to grasp as we go forward into curved spacetime. Euclid's line segments, once laid down and extended, keep their orientation and their straightness in the common sense way of thinking, and in the carried arrow way of thinking. Spacetime curvature will have something to say about this. Now then, the fifth postulate is the one that we're going to play around with a lot. Let's start with two lines. These are our infinitely extended lines. They could be in any orientation in three dimensions, but we want them to be in the same plane. So now we have these two lines. Now we toss a third line into the mix such that it intersects both of our original lines. If we examine the interior angles of both sides of the intersection, we will then choose the side where the sum of the two angles is less than the sum of two right angles, that is 180 degrees or pi radians. Let's then follow our original two lines on that side all the way out to infinity. Euclid's axiom says that well before we reach the lazy eight, those two lines must intersect. Now this is an interesting thought. It's distinctly not like a pair of train tracks. Train tracks, even though they do seem to converge in the distance, we know they never do, the railroad ties keep the tracks at a fixed width for the length of the train track. This means that at every point along the train track, the ties intersect at 90 degrees or at right angles to the tracks. The train tracks are parallel, but generally two lines extending off into the distance are not. For any two lines on a plane, there's exactly one orientation of both lines such that they are parallel. All other orientations mean that they will eventually intersect. This is the concept of Euclid's fifth postulate, known as the parallel postulate. But here's the thing about the parallel postulate. It was found in the 19th century to be unprovable from the other four postulates. It was also shown back then that we can devise mathematical spaces where the fifth postulate does not hold. That is, where infinitely long straight lines in the loose sense pointed towards each other away down the road will never intersect, even if they're on the same plane. Likewise, we can devise spaces where such non-parallel lines intersect an infinite number of times. Worse, we can make spaces where in one place, say where you started, they are parallel in the Euclidean axiom 5 sense, but far down the road they intersect or diverge. There are an infinite number of spaces where the carried arrow idea gets messed around with and the arrows get turned around even though they were locally stepped along in the normal sense of the word straight. Let's see how that goes.